Our reading is from John 17, reading the first 11 verses. And I assume that's page 111 in your few Bibles. John is different from the synoptic, the other first three Gospels. And even in the last days of Jesus' life, is different. He has what we call the discourses in the upper room, chapters 14, 15, and 16. And then sometime after that, this chapter, and perhaps he was already on the way to the Mount of Olives, and they stopped for a while, he offered this prayer. We're not exactly certain. But it's called the farewell prayer, his last prayer with the disciples, and a rather complete one. Or it's called the high priestly prayer for what it does. He prays for the disciples and for all those who believe on him through their word. So John 17, remembering especially the words of eternal life. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the word that you gave to me, I have given to them. And they have received them. And know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I'm not asking on behalf of the world. But on behalf of those whom you gave me. Because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. Word of the Lord. in this chapter, Jesus early on in his prayer speaks of eternal life to give to those whom God has given to him. Then he goes on to tell us what it is. This is the eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And I told this the essence of eternal life. But I'm not sure essence is something we use very much anymore, the word. I know I've seen it in perfume ads, and then it means, you know, well, the, the, the scent, and hopefully that scent is of the very heart and core of the perfume. Because that's what the word means, the very heart and soul, the core, the center. And it's that center of eternal life that I want to speak about with you this morning. And Jesus says again, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So I want to paraphrase that and tell you that I think it goes into three parts. Eternal life is, first of all, knowledge. Secondly, knowledge of God. 
And in the third place, knowledge of God in Christ. Well, I suppose nothing is quite as ambiguous as telling you that eternal life is knowledge. I'm not sure we have any idea yet what that might mean. So let me give you some examples because the word to know is one of those words that has a whole variety of meanings. Maybe as ambiguous as the word love. Or for native Alaskans, word snow. <coughs> Let me give three examples of love, or excuse me, of knowing. Totally different, not in cross of the word, but give us some idea. The first and simplest is, you know, to know about something or to know in that sense. You know, if we're at a party and we're introduced to somebody and we're scratching our heads at it, I'm pretty sure I met that person you can say, don't I know you? And all it means is having we met at least once before. That's the simplest kind of knowing. <laughs> Certainly not what Jesus is saying here. Well, have we heard or read about God? No, it's much more than that. And the kind of intermediate use of the word know is to understand. Sometimes there's confusion between these first two. For example, you know, I may know that three times three is nine. And I certainly know that in the first sense. But maybe I know it in the second sense of understanding. Because if I have three of something here, three units here, three units here, and three units here, then by definition, I have nine units. Perhaps that's enough to understand the concept. Maybe a better illustration is Einstein's theory of relativity. You know, I know that in the first sense. I've heard it many times. I've read the formula. But I don't understand it in the slightest. <laughs> Perhaps my son, my oldest son does, he's a PhD in physics. In his first year in graduate school, he taught thermodynamics and other complicated courses. And uh, I haven't asked him lately, but he probably begins to understand. But even that isn't what Jesus is saying. He's not saying if we understand God, we have eternal. I suppose it's possible that someone can understand the whole of Scripture. I certainly don't claim to, and I don't know anyone else that probably would. But it's possible. But that's still not enough. So there's a third, more comprehensive meaning to the word, to know. Let me try to tell you a little story about that. They're two boys, Mark and Bruce. They're first graders, you know, they've been friends all the way since probably some kind of nursery school or something. They're neighbors, friends, always together, inseparable companions. One day, Mark gets 50 cents from his father on the way to the school. You know, he's walked to school, they went past a corner store, you know, and then walked a couple of blocks to school. Well, Mark with his 50 cents, you know, runs into the store for a minute, come, sees a little bag of M&M's, my favorite candy, comes out with them in his pocket. You know, knowing little boys, not very long before Bruce has figured out what's going on. And he says, Mark, you know me. We may not use that meaning of the word much anymore. But it's perfectly good English. Still today, it certainly was ancient English. What does he mean? You're acquainted with me? He knows that very well. You know, they've been buddies for probably as long as he can remember. 
Does he mean you understand me? Certainly not. At this point, he doesn't don't give a fig whether you understand them or not. What he's saying in effect is, hey buddy, how about some candy? <laughs> Perfectly good use of the word no. You know, it's a close and intimate relationship with someone. A relationship on which we can have time to resume. How about some candy? How about some help? Isn't that what we often say to God? How about some help? That's the kind of knowledge, this close, intimate relationship. And Jesus says it's a close, intimate relationship with the only true God. I think a very carefully phrased statement. Remember, Pastor Bill said a couple of weeks ago, I'm not sure if it was Wednesday night or Sunday anymore, but he talked about the thousands of gods the Greeks and Romans had, especially if you combine them together, which was true in these days. And I've never tried to count them, but I always like to say, well, you know, the Greeks and the Romans had a god or a goddess for every conceivable act and fact of life. Whether it was legal or illegal, moral or immoral, they had a god or goddess for it. Some were only a small group, maybe a clan. Others, the whole empire believed in. But in Jesus' time, there was certainly this rampant polytheism. Well, just add another god, that's fine. Probably what the people on Mars Hill were going to do with Paul, you know, that's still the only known God. But Jesus says, the only God. Not several that you have to choose from, but only one. The living God. And so, to back that up, he says, the only true God. You can have one God, but it may still be an idol. Joy David, one of my favorite authors, has a little small book on the Ten Commandments called Smoke on the Mountain. She was for a short time the uh, wife of Sinclair Lewis. Anyway, she said, in a chapter, the shape of an idol, you can be anything. It could be the hood ornament on your Rolls Royce, some appliance in your kitchen, maybe the total of them, or almost anything else. And so Jesus says, the only true God. Jeremiah says, you know, the Lord, Yahweh is the true God, the living God. In some stands, all other gods are helpless and idols. So we have to have this close relationship with the living God. I hope you're saying, you know, how is this possible? Because Reformed Presbyterian theology, and I hope all theology, all Christian faiths have always said, there is no way from man to God. No way. Karl Barth, the great theologian of the last century, said, there's a death line between man and God. There's a line up there which if you get to it, you're dead. You know, he gave the example of Uzzah and the ark. Uzzah, the one from Levi, walking along with the ark. And he thought it was going to fall, so he reached out to stabilize it. And uh, that's what Carl Barth has in mind when he talked about the death of mind. No way from man to God. But what happened? 
Romans, God came to us. That's the whole full meaning of the incarnation. God with us. Christ, the Son of the living God, coming to earth. Becoming human like us. So in the third place is the knowledge of God in Christ. And I like to say in Christ because that's a great theme of the Apostle Paul in all of his letters. He keeps saying we have to be in Christ. In Christ we are new creatures. Creatures who have I said in Christ, although we probably should technically say through Christ. No, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that's what he's saying here when he adds, and Jesus Christ. We cannot know God except through Jesus Christ. We cannot in any way go to God. But God has come to us. That's the deep meaning of Christmas. The deep meaning of Easter. The real meaning of Pentecost. In these weeks between Easter and Pentecost. That we celebrate through the Holy Communion. Christ is with us. To give us that deep, intimate, personal relationship with the Father. I am the Father, part one. Eternal life is the knowledge of God in Christ. What I want to leave with you, especially in regard to that, is that means that we already have eternal life when we believe in God through Jesus Christ. You know, Christ himself says, whoever believes has eternal life. Not will have, but has. So death doesn't interrupt this life, it just brings in a new stage. Christ's coming again brings in the final stage of this new life. But we have eternal life now when we believe. This is life eternal, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ.